Hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Mitch Jenkins. I'm a senior loan officer with Your Home Financial. And uh, what I've done here is created a first time home buyer guide. Did it as a slideshow, really just to help anybody that is considering buying a home, thinking of buying one, kind of arm yourself with some information because there's a kind of a veil when it comes to lending and kind of what goes on, how things work. So I want to give you a little bit of a peek behind that veil. When I bought my first home, I was a retail store manager and had no idea how mortgages work. So now that I have been in the industry for over 10 years, have a much better understanding of kind of the ins and outs, how things work. I wanted to share some of that knowledge with you and just help a first time home buyer kind of get their feet wet, help them you know, understand some of the terminology and and what to expect. So it's titled Purchasing a Home, What You Should Know. What it's going to cover with you is are some general mortgage terms, help you get familiar with some of the, the more common terms that you'll come across, help you explain what a mortgage is, how you get one, and uh, some of the different types of mortgages out there. It might be a little bit lengthy and feel free to kind of skip ahead to some of the things that might interest you a little bit more, but you know, my main goal here is to give you a much better understanding of some of these topics and how things work. Diving right in under general mortgage terms, first thing to know is a lender. What is a lender? Ultimately, their job, or in this case, my job, is to qualify my clients and then help get your mortgage funded. There's a lot to that aspect making sure that the client is eligible to purchase a home. We need to look at things like your income, your assets, your credit, kind of put all that together and uh, figure out your budget, figure out what you can afford, and ultimately make sure that we can get your loan closed. Now, the lender may or may not be the servicer, and we'll talk a little bit about what the servicer is here next, but it's important to know if the, the servicing were to change after your loan closes, the person you make your payment to, that can change. Uh, but it won't change the terms of your loan. So once you get that locked in and that loan is closed with your lender, no matter who services it, that will never change the terms of your loan. So the servicer, ultimately they collect a payment. Their job is to manage your loan once it's closed. And again, it may or may not be the original lender. Can transfer several times. And you know that can be frustrating because you set up auto pay and you, you know your payment's taken out every month and then you might get a notice after a few months that hey your servicer is changing so it's important to know the lender must or the servicer must provide notice ahead of time to let you know that the servicing is changing but unfortunately if that happens there's nothing you can do about it um, that's just part of the process there is a whole secondary market that kind of operates behind the scenes where lenders that maybe they want to raise some cash or get some liquidity on their books they might take a bunch of loans, bundle them up, and sell them to another servicer who's in a little different position who can afford to sit back and wait for those monthly payments to come in. So that's just one reason why they might do that, but just to give you some insight as to how that works or why that might happen. Another important term is going to be your appraisal. They are always going to be a third party. And what I mean by that is they're not going to be an employee of the lender. We are not allowed to have any direct contact with appraisers anymore. That's because they don't want the lender to influence the opinion of value. So that's why we have a appraiser who is a licensed expert to determine the value of properties. That's what they do is go out independently, tell the lender, here's what they think the home's worth based on a few factors. And some of the main factors, as you can see here in the graphic, are you know the location of the home, the uh, market, just the general health of the market, and that can change by month, quarter, year. As time passes, the market can shift just like the stock market does. You have the age of the property, so that can be important. Uh, the condition is very important, how well kept and maintained that house is. Um, any potential improvements that have been done to that house, and then ultimately the neighborhood the home is in. Those are some of the biggest driving factors as to how much a home is going to be worth. You could have two identical homes across the street from each other in the same market, in the same neighborhood, but one might have a much better condition, it was better maintained, it has a lot of improvements, and that house is going to be worth more. So the appraiser ultimately determines the value. We want to make sure that if we're, if the lender is going to be putting out, in, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars, they need to know that that home is worth that. They need, they need to know it's a solid investment because we don't want you overpaying for a home and, and buying a house for 200000 that's only worth 150 because if you want to turn around and sell it, you're going to be in a world of hurt trying to get rid of it. And also, uh, if you stop paying that mortgage, the lender needs to know that if they need to and, and foreclose on that home, that they're going to be able to get at least close to what that home is worth. Now, the appraiser is another thing that's important to know. They're not working for the buyer. Now, they are required in most purchases, but they're actually working for the lender. Now, if you were to buy a house, a lot of times you're going to be advised to get an inspection. 
Now the inspector is somebody that's hired to really dig into the nooks and crannies of the home, figure out what might be wrong or what kind of maintenance issues you might have. They work for you. So if you hire them and you pay them to do an inspection, they're going to report back any and every little thing that they might find and they are working for you directly. But the appraiser is actually working for the lender. They'll report any major safety concerns or something that could be a big issue with that home, but ultimately their job is to determine the value. Next up, we'll talk about the title company. They do a lot of work behind the scenes to get your mortgage done. Now when you get a mortgage, it's actually considered a lien on the title of the property. So the title determines any owners. It lists any owners of that particular home. So if you buy a house, you will be listed on the title as an owner. Now, the title company needs to make sure that you have a clean and clear title. That's one of the big functions. They do some other things, but that's the big one because when you buy a house, if unless you buy it in cash, you're going to have a lien on that title. And until you pay your mortgage off completely, that lien will stay on your title. Now, the, more, the, the title company wants to make sure there's no other liens. So when you buy a house, nobody else can lay claim and say that they have some type of ownership in your property. Now, once you pay that mortgage off completely, that lien is lifted and you have free and clear title to that property. So that is yours and yours alone. If you stop paying that mortgage, that lender can come in and take that home from you because of non-payment and not agreeing to pay back the terms of that loan. Big thing the title company does is make sure you have clean title. They also insure it. So if anybody down the road, say five, 10 years from now, comes in and says, no, 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 I I, uh, I have ownership. I uh, you know made a deal with my brother-in-law or whatever it might've been. That title company is then going to protect you and ensure that they cannot take your home from you. They also collect the money for closing. So when uh, everyone gets paid at the end of the process, the realtors get their commissions, the uh, county gets paid any taxes that are due, um, the uh, seller gets paid off, all that money actually goes through the title company. So they provide a notary who will sit down with you and sign the closing documents and a few other functions, but they, they're kind of the glue that holds the whole process together. Now some of the fees that you might see on your title work are like recording fees, and that's a cost to record the mortgage because once you change owners, the county has to then update their records and record it. So that's a common fee. Uh, you might see a transfer tax. Depending on your county, there could be a transfer tax just to transfer that property. There's title policy, which is going to protect the seller and ensure the buyer is getting a clear title. We talked a little bit about that already. And then notary fees. You will have to sit down with a notary at the closing. And they are licensed. They have a seal. And they will make sure that the documents that you sign are legit and get filed with the county accordingly. Some of the common fees that you'll see. Big term that, that is often misunderstood are points. So when it comes to getting a mortgage, you could pay points to get yourself a better interest rate. One of the easiest ways to kind of visualize this is if you are on a teeter-totter and you have closing costs on one side and you have an interest rate on the other. If one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. So what I mean by that is if you have a specific interest rate on one side and you want a lower one, you've seen lower rates advertised or maybe you just have a rate in mind that you really, really want. If you want, you could buy down that interest rate by paying points. Now, one point equals 1% of your loan. Pretty easy calculation. It's going to be a little different for everybody depending on what you're buying. In essence, what it's doing is prepaying some interest. Now, the way I, I kind of break this down is if you're at a casino, the lender is the house. The house is usually going to win. Not to say you cannot win, but the odds are usually stacked towards the house. So if you pay points to get a better rate, it's a guarantee you're going to be out some money and that lender is going to collect because you have to pay whether it's a point or half a point or three points you're paying that up front with your costs so the lender gets their money up front and they're going to then give you a lower interest rate now then it then it goes on you depending on how long you stay in that home to recoup that cost or investment however you want to look at it now uh, one example if you paid a thousand dollars in points and let's say you're saving $10 a month. It's going to take you about 100 months to recoup that investment. So if you stay in the home for three, four years and sell, well, you just wasted some money because you will never see the full $1,000 back in your pocket. But 
if you stay in that home for 15, 20, or all 30 years and never change your mortgage, well then eventually you're gonna recoup that $1,000 and come out ahead. It's a good discussion to have with your loan officer. And if you're in a position where you have some extra funds, sometimes paying points will benefit you in the long run as opposed to just putting a few extra $1,000 towards your down payment. So again, important things to know. Um, now the graphic here, there's actually two different types of points, positive and negative. What happens is if you pay points, that, that's considered positive. As I said, it's like you're paying interest up front. Now there's negative points too. So let's say you're very comfortable making the payment, that's not the issue, but coming up with the cash for the down payment and closing costs is, you could talk about negative points. And that's where the lender actually gives you a credit Again, picture the teeter-totter. Well, if your closing costs go down, well, then that means your rate is going to go up. So you could take a higher rate, and then instead of paying points, you can actually get credit for points, and the lender will actually cover some of your closing costs. Again, we can talk more in detail about your situation when you are looking to make an offer. Very quickly, that hopefully gives you an idea of how points work. So next up, what is a mortgage? That's actually a question that comes up quite often. Uh, it's one of the most commonly searched Google searches when it comes to mortgage terms. So legally, it's an agreement by which a bank or other creditor lends money at interest in exchange for taking title of the debtor's property with the condition that the conveyance of title becomes void upon the payment of the debt. Layman's terms, that just means if you take out a loan to buy a property because most people can't afford to buy homes in cash. So you take out a loan, once it's paid, that mortgage gets released and then you become full owner of the property. But until then, that is a lien taken up on that property. If you don't make payments, that lender has the right to come and take that away from you. As I mentioned before, courts can attach a lien to your property. And until it's paid in full, that lender or whoever puts a lien on that property could enforce it and come and take it from you or force you to sell to pay off that lien. Aside from a mortgage, some other common liens you might come across are tax liens. If you have a business and you decide not to pay taxes or you owe quite a bit in uh, property taxes or whatever it might be, the government can just come in and put a lien on your property. They can determine that, hey, you own, you own this home, well, hey, we're going to attach a lien. Now, the thing with the government, they can put their lien ahead of the lender's lien. They're the only people that can do that. Now, if a, let's say you stop paying a credit card and uh, they sue you, you go to court, the judge says, hey, you owe $10,000 to this credit card company. They can then attach a lien to your property, but they cannot put it ahead of the lender. Reason that matters is because when you go to sell or that property gets, gets sold or liquidated, the liens are going to get paid off in the order that they are recorded. So the first lien gets paid first. If there's money left over, they'll pay the next lien and the next lien and so on. So that's why it's very important within all of that title work, as I said before, that you are getting a clean title because lenders want to make sure their lien is number one. Certainly don't want the government to come in and take over the first lien spot, but that can happen if you are not careful. Next up, we'll talk a little bit about how do I get a mortgage. Now, the first thing to know is you must qualify. So the main four areas that lenders look at are going to be your income. They need to know how it works, how much you make, and how consistent it is and so on. Um, the property itself, because believe it or not, the type of property um, or your purpose for buying the property can have a huge impact. For example, a condo can give you slightly different pricing than a single family home. Uh, a multi-family home, so if you buy like a two, three, or four unit property, that can have different pricing than a single family home. Uh, also your purpose, so if you're trying to buy it as an investment and rent it out to make money, or are you going to live in it? So those, those are the little things about the property that lenders need to understand. We'll look at your assets. It's important to know where the money's coming from for your down payment and your closing costs, because thanks to the Patriot Act, uh, there are a lot of new anti, well, newer anti-money laundering laws in place, and these things really make us dig deep and review where that money's coming from when it's involved in a mortgage transaction. And the last thing everybody knows is your credit. We need to have a good understanding of your credit, what's on there. And while the score is important, that's not the only thing lenders look at. We're also going to be looking at your history. Do you have collections? Do you have any kind of public record items like judgments or liens? And then they're also going to look at the minimum payments on all the things that you've borrowed so we can calculate your debt ratio. Debt ratio is an important part of this, helps us understand how much of a payment you can afford. Jumping into the income, some different types of income to, to be familiar with. You have your salary employee, 
that makes life easy for lenders. We, we know what you're going to make that year. Hourly, you know, as long as your hours are consistent, that is almost just as good as a salary. Now, commission is where it can be a little tough because that can be up and down. Depending on how you get paid, the uh, underwriters, who are the people kind of behind the scenes that ultimately approve your loans or your mortgages, um, they love consistency. And when things are trending up, even or up, that's good. When they're trending down, that can be difficult, make it harder to qualify. So a bonus is very similar to commission because it may or may not be consistent. It can be up and down from year to year, depending on how you get paid. Investment income, that is kind of a mixed bag depending on where your investments are coming from, but a lot of times we can use investment income. And then if you have like a pension or social security, those are usually pretty solid because again, those are gonna be set. That's kind of like having a salaried job. And what does that mean for you? Your income will determine what documents are required for your loan. So in a situation where you're salaried or hourly, it should be pretty simple. Pay stubs, W-2s. But if you're an independent contractor, subcontractor, maybe you uh, you know get paid different ways, well, then we might need some 1099s because if you work multiple different jobs or job sites throughout the year, you might have multiple different 1099s. We might need tax returns. We might need award letters for things like your pension or social security. Uh, if you are a business owner and you file separate returns for personal and business, well, we could need your business returns in addition to the personal. And then there's always the possibility of additional information or further explanations. So our job is to kind of help put everything together, make sure things are consistent, and get the underwriters what they need to ultimately approve your file. So we'll dive into some different property types to help you understand how that can impact you. So here's a couple of the more common ones or a few. Uh, you have a single family home, that's kind of the standard. You have four walls and a roof. You might have a multifamily home where you have you know split level up and down or side by side, but it could be uh, anything from one to four units that would fall under a residential loan. If you go above four units, then you're into commercial, and that's a whole different animal. We won't really talk about that. Now, you could live in a PUD, a plan unit development. That's what you might call like a development where a lot of the houses are, are single family homes, but you might have a homeowners association where maybe there's some common areas or maybe you have like a lake or a rec center or something like that that everybody has to chip in for with that homeowners association. Condominium. Now, that can be a little interesting because some condominiums are actually just like single family homes, but the way the builder sets them up can determine whether or not it's a condominium. So, you know, when you dive into that, that's more, you're going to almost always have some kind of common areas and some maybe swimming pools and things like that where uh, everybody has to pay an association. Some condominiums are high rises. They kind of look like hotels or apartment buildings, but that, that might be the traditional condominium that people think of. But again, depending on how the builder sets it up, you might see, you know, single family homes or cluster homes that are technically condominiums. Um, a townhome, that's uh, kind of the same thing. It's, it's, it can be similar to a condo, but a lot of times townhomes have a common wall. It's like your own house, you got your own yard and everything, but you have a wall that connects you to a neighbor or maybe multiple neighbors. So those are typically what townhomes are. But again, it's all up to the builder how they classify it when they construct the home. A manufactured home, that's where you might think of like a, a mobile home where it's like a metal wall. Manufactured homes have come a long way. They're not just for mobile home parks. There are pretty nice manufactured homes out there and they can actually be set up on land and uh, you don't have to be in a park where you rent the land. You can actually have a manufactured home on property that you own. Modular homes, similar to manufactured, but they're more of like a, what you call a stick-built home. So modular home is something that's like prefabricated. It comes in in pieces, usually two or more. So by definition, a manufactured home is usually two parts that are kind of seamed at the middle. Modular home might, might look when it's built more like a traditional single family home because it's built with studs and it has all the wood and everything and they kind of bring it in pieces and assemble it on site at the joints. And then the last thing would be a mobile home, which is again, slightly different than your manufactured home. But a mobile home, you basically it's on wheels, you can pick it up and take it somewhere. So that's very hard to get lending on. All right, now to dig a little deeper into property types and why they matter, um, because if you're buying the house as your primary home and your purpose is to live there, maybe even raise a family, that's gonna generally get you the best rates on the market. Now, you might consider any real estate purchase and investment, your primary purpose here is, is to live. It's gonna get you, like I said, the best rates and terms available as opposed to buying a house as an investment or for another reason. Now a second home, or maybe a vacation home, that's 
kind of what it's for. Kind of maybe a seasonal getaway, maybe a place that you want to take vacations, or um, you know, here in Ohio, a lot we have a lot of snowbirds, is what they're called. So you might live here for part of the year, but then maybe in the winter for four or five months, you head down south and, and stay in your vacation home in Florida. So that is going to be slightly different terms than a primary home. So one of those other terms could be, for example, a higher down payment or possibly a slight rate adjustment. But usually the terms are pretty close to as if you're buying a primary residence. Now, if it's an investment property, the purpose is to make money. You're not gonna live there, somebody else is. That is definitely gonna come with different terms. You typically pay a higher rate. You're probably gonna have a larger down payment. And you know, one theme to know is everything in lending is based on risk. Now, if you own a home and now you're buying multiple properties, getting into investing, you become a riskier proposition to lend on because the more mortgages you have, the more risk you're taking on. Now, as time goes by, you might get better and better at it and create your own real estate empire. A lot of people have done it, but for starters, buying an investment property is a riskier proposition to the lender, so the terms are gonna be a little more stringent. All right, so to help kind of visualize why the different property types matter and how this is going to impact you potentially. We'll talk about loan level price adjustments. Now every lender out there has these adjustments. They're basically built into their pricing when it comes to your interest rates. We talked a little bit about points earlier um, and to help kind of illustrate this I just want to use a simple example. If you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house one point which is one percent is going to be a thousand dollars. So for reference here, I'm going to skip over a cash out refinance because we're, we're focused more on purchasing. Um, now an investment property, you can see a huge jump, 2.125, so two and an eighth of a percent. So if you're buying a $100,000 house for yourself, and then you're buying a $100,000 house to invest in, you're going to pay two and an eighth points for that same exact rate just because it's an investment. So that $100,000 house is going to cost over $2,000 more because it's an investment. Now, if it's a multi-unit property, like a three to four unit property, you might have to pay a point. And then uh, if a condo, because it's a condo, less than 20% down, you might have to pay three quarters of a point. I uh, won't get into the why, but just know that that's a common adjustment. Again, every lender out there may not have these exact adjustments, but you're going to see these loan level price adjustments based on the type of property. Now, next up, we'll talk about assets. Very important to know, as I mentioned before, because of the Patriot Act, where your money's coming from. Some acceptable sources are if you have money in a bank account, if it's an investment that you're going to liquidate, if it's an employer that's helping to pay relocation costs or even a gift from a relative, those are usually pretty solid sources. We have to document it. We have to, to provide paperwork to show everything is on the up and up. Those are pretty much accepted sources. Now, unacceptable is going to be cash or mattress money. Most loans will not allow you to bring cash to the table. I grew up uh, with the term cash is king. Not, not anymore. Unfortunately, the government loves being able to trace things and see and make sure that this is not laundered money. And then, as you can see, untraceable sources, meaning if we just have money appear in your bank account, doesn't mean it's good. So you can't just move the money in your bank and say, oh, it's in the bank now, it's good. A lot of times we're going to ask questions and, and need to know where that came from. And if it just appeared or you don't have a paper trail of where that money came from, chances are you're not going to be able to use it on your mortgage. Credit. So another topic we talked about was credit. And I want to go over why it's important and how it can affect you here. So the better the credit, the better your terms are going to be on borrowing, period. Uh, and this goes across the board, whether it's a car, whether it's a credit card, especially a mortgage. The more you take care of your credit, the better off you're going to be able to borrow money at any time in your life. Now, this gives you kind of a range of what's excellent all the way down to what's very bad. So 8 to 850 on a lending scale, I mean, that's excellent. You're, you're in great shape. Very good is going to be kind of the 750 to 799 range and so on. So if you're down below 600, it's going to be very, very difficult to get a, a mortgage. Now, even if you're in the poor to fair range, that can be, that can be tough. Um, there could be some hurdles, some roadblocks. So a lot of times you're going to be able to qualify as long as you have a compensating factor. And uh, as I said before, everything's based on risk. So if you have a low credit score, okay. Do you have money in the bank? Do you have a really good debt ratio? Or are you trying to use every penny you have for the down payment and max out your debt ratio? Those are things the underwriters are going to look at. And sometimes if one area is, is lacking or hurting, 
the other area can kind of pick it up and carry that weight. So everything kind of plays in together. That's important to know, but there are hard lines in the sand when it comes to your credit. If you're below a certain number, you will not qualify. And just because you're above a minimum credit score doesn't guarantee you qualify because those other factors are gonna be taken into account as well. Now, how is your credit score determined? So here's kind of the easiest ways to visualize how your credit works. Now, 35% of your score is really just based on your payment history, how good you are at paying your bills on time. So if you have no late payments, you've never been behind, you don't have any collections or anything like that, that's great, but that's only 35% of your score. Now, almost just as important is the amounts owed. So you have 30% of your score based on how much you owe. Now, the biggest culprits or the biggest ways to kind of impact this portion of your score are your revolving debts. And to take a step back, your credit is kind of broken down into a few different types of debt. So a mortgage is its own class, a mortgage debt. Now you have uh, installment debt. So picture a car payment or a student loan where you would borrow a set amount, you pay a set amount for a certain amount of years, and then it's gone. Uh, that's an installment debt. Now a revolving debt, this is really how you can make or break your score in a lot of ways. And that is gonna be uh, things like credit cards where you can charge it up, pay it down, charge it up, pay it down. But it's revolving, it's constantly changing based on your behavior and your usage. So the more you owe on your credit cards, the worse it gets. So it's good to have it, you need credit, but you wanna keep it under control. Keep it, keep the balances low, that's gonna again, drive 30% of your scores just based on how much you owe on those accounts. You have 10% based on new credit, so when you open new accounts, it can kind of set you back a little bit for the short term, but as you make payments and as you manage that account, you're gonna recover that. And the 15% is length of credit history. Kind of sounds redundant, but what that means is more how long have you kept these accounts open so if you have a discover card from 2002 but you don't use it it's still good to keep that open maybe once in a while or show some activity as opposed to closing it out and opening a brand new account so the the credit bureaus like to see that you have long-standing accounts with companies and then lastly 10 percent is based on your credit mix so what that means is the different types of accounts it's good to have one of each or maybe even a couple of each so if you just have two revolving debts and nothing else, well, you're, you're losing out on the potential, like 10% of your score could be improved if you had an installment debt along with a credit card, maybe some revolving debt, and then maybe a mortgage too. So it's good to have a different mix of credit because again, it shows the credit bureaus that uh, you, know, you can manage different types of accounts responsibly. Now, this chart, I, I don't want you to get, get too overwhelmed here, but I want to kind of show you one extreme to the other. And this is just to show you how credit can impact your rate and how much you pay. So at the top left, you have a credit score greater than 740, greater than or equal, or equal to, and a loan to value less than or equal to 60%. So in a perfect world, if you had 40% to put down on a mortgage and 740 or higher credit, you're not going to pay any points. That's a good situation. And then if you go down that list, if you're putting a good amount down, you can see that you, you don't get affected a whole lot even as your credit score goes down because, because you're able to put so much money down, you, you're not quite as big of a risk. Now, if you follow that all the way to the right and go down, your, your loan to values get higher and higher, meaning you're putting less and less money down. On the left side, you can see as your credit score goes down, you see these percentages go up. So what this means, if you look in the bottom right, where you have the 95.01 to 97%, so that means you're putting like three to 5% down, and your credit is say below 620, you're looking at paying 3.75 points. If you go back to that $100,000 example I mentioned earlier, somebody comes in with a 800 credit score and, and they're putting 40% down, you're not paying any points whatsoever. However, if you have 620 credit and you're putting you know three or 4% down, you're gonna pay $3,750 more on that $100,000 mortgage. And then as you can see, there's a whole bunch of things in between. You can always come back and maybe pause the video to, to dig in. And, and again, keep in mind, this is an example. This isn't a guarantee that your specific lender or what we offer. This is just to kind of highlight and give you an idea of what lenders typically look at. Giving you a, a glimpse behind the veil as to how, how things work and ultimately how your rate is determined. 
All right, so next up we have some charts here. Ultimately what this does is illustrate how things can impact your credit score. It, this is important to know because there are some things that, that can really, really affect you and take a long time to recover from. So at any cost, you wanna to try to avoid these types of situations. Now we're human, we make mistakes. Sometimes these things will happen. So if nothing else, this is just gonna give you an idea of what you can expect, uh, You know how long it could take to recover from something like this. If we look, there's two different uh, uh, charts. The top one is showing you the impact, like how much your score could drop based on something happening. So you have three different consumers, A, B, and C. You know, one starting at 680 and then 720 and then 780. It shows you, like, let's say you have a 30 day late on your mortgage. That 680 is going to drop down to 6 or 620. So you're losing 60 to 80 points just on one late payment on that mortgage. And then let's say we go down to like a foreclosure or a bankruptcy down towards the bottom of that first chart those are huge hits to your score. So for example, if you had a 780 credit, you're in excellent shape, you've, you've been fantastic your whole life, but something major happens and now you gotta, you gotta declare a bankruptcy, that 740 could turn into a five, I'm sorry, that 780 could turn into a 540 to a 560 just like that, pretty much overnight by filing a bankruptcy. Now as you go down to the next chart, this is actually showing you the time to fully recover from an event like this. So just for example, if you had a 30 day late on the mortgage, could take you anywhere from nine months to three years for that to basically be forgiven, water under the bridge, doesn't affect you anymore. If you go down to say a foreclosure or a bankruptcy, you're looking at quite a long period of time to wait before you can recover from that. Keep in mind your credit model and, and your scoring and how this works can change. The bureaus are constantly looking for ways to create new algorithms to better predict behavior and to understand who's more likely to pay their debt and who's not. But this is just to give you an idea, give you a little bit of a glimpse as to how these things work and how much of an impact they can have on your credit. So what can you do to help maintain your credit? Now it's important to know I'm not a licensed credit repair expert, but being in my line of work, I have a pretty good understanding of how this works and, and you know ways to help my clients. FICO actually stands for Fair Isaac and Company. Those are the gentlemen that created the model that companies use, the, your FICO score. So you can go to myfico.com and educate yourself on anything and everything you wanna know about your score, how it's created, the different models that industries use. There's not just one FICO score. That's a very big misconception. So many people, I used to think that too. I, hey, FICO scores your FICO score, that's it. Well, depends on the scale because lenders uh, are gonna use their own scale for their industry. So a car dealer is gonna have a different scale, therefore a different score than a mortgage company will. Same thing with if you're borrowing a student loan or you're trying to open a credit card. They have different scales that they use. And if you go to myfigo.com, they can really break that down for you. It takes credit to get credit. And what that means is ultimately, if you wanna buy a house, uh, it's one of the biggest things on most people's credit. You need to start somewhere. You can't just dive right in, never open a credit card in your life, and, and just get a mortgage. So you really need to focus on some little things, start, small and build your credit so that way when the time comes you can get that bigger item like a vehicle or a home. Now secure credit card is a great way to start and a lot of times your local bank can help you with that. You basically put some money into an account then you get a credit card and use it just like a credit card. You charge it, you pay it, you charge it, you pay it and meanwhile that bank holds on to that money so that way if you ever stop paying it they're covered but in the meantime what they're doing is reporting that to the credit bureaus as if it's just a normal credit card, and that can help. I mean, it's a great way to start building credit, or if the credit's not where you want it to be, that's a great way to help get it where you need to be. One huge thing is keep your balances low. I talked a little bit about that um, you know, utilization on revolving debt. Keep it down as best you can. You wanna pay on time? Anything over 30 days will report late. So, I mean, the good news there, if you're a day or two or even a week behind your due date, not the end of the world. You might get assessed a late fee, but it's not gonna get reported to the credit bureaus until it's 30 days late. Only borrow what you can afford. A lot of us have gotten into trouble with credit cards and I'm no exception. Anytime you're borrowing money, just make sure you don't wanna borrow it just based on what that minimum payment is and think, hey, I can afford it, the payment's only this per month. You really wanna make sure that that's something you could afford, but let's put it on your credit so you can help build that and establish your credit history. 
annualcreditreport.com. That is a great site. Uh, it's actually the only site that the government sponsors for you to get your free credit report. So anything with free in the name, it's probably not free. So annualcreditreport.com. You can go on there, submit your information, and once a year, you're able to get a free credit report. Um, the government ensures that that's available to you. Now, to get your score, you would have to pay but at least it shows you what's reporting on there so you know if there's any inaccuracies or anything that you need to get taken care of. All right, so let's get on to types of mortgages. You have fixed and you have adjustable. So in its name, you know, a fixed rate is going to be fixed for the full term. So if you do a 30-year loan, it is fixed the entire time. Now adjustable usually has a period of time where it's fixed but then becomes adjustable. There can be a lot of different terms to those type of mortgages so if you do want to get into an adjustable they can be great loans just make sure you understand and have that conversation with your loan officer. Now the terms are usually going to be between 10 and 30. There can be exceptions but that's typically where most mortgages are going to fall. So that means you have 10 years or up to 30 years to pay it back. There is a conventional loan. That's kind of the standard loan. What I mean by that is pretty much any lender out there that does mortgages offers conventional loans. Now those are loans that are insured or guaranteed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now I hinted about the secondary market earlier and uh, ultimately Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they set the rules on what lenders need to do to qualify people. So we need to meet their guidelines, check all their boxes, and if we do, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will insure that loan. So if we did everything we were supposed to and set it up properly, but you don't pay it, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will step in and it's a guaranteed investment for those lenders. And that way if we're, we're selling the servicing rights on that secondary market, if it's insured by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it looks a lot better to any potential buyers. Now next you have government loans. Not every lender offers government loans, but these are loans that are and can be great for clients for various reasons, but they're basically insured by the government. Now you have an FHA loan at its inception was designed to help first time home buyers. There was a time where you had to put 20% down to buy a house. Well, FHA changed that and said, hey, you can do three and a half percent down now. So that was a huge game changer for the mortgage industry. Helped a lot of people, especially first time home buyers, get into their first home. Now a VA loan, it's exclusively for veterans, has some great benefits. Any veteran that's considering buying a house, um, the VA is going to be an option to consider. USDA, that is more for rural properties. So not every home is eligible for USDA financing because that's based on location. So the USDA is ultimately designed to help people in rural areas get into homes with low down payment options. Then you have Jumbo, which is a non-conforming loan. A conforming loan meets you know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's guidelines. Anything above that, which at the time of recording here is 647200 for most of America. So what that means is if you buy a house and the mortgage is going to be greater than 647200, you're in the jumbo range. So that just means things qualify a little bit differently. Ultimately, it's harder to qualify because a larger loan amount means higher risk for the lender. So there's going to be some increased stipulations when it comes to getting you qualified. So to dive into conventional a little bit, it's kind of the standard loan. It fits the mold for investors. And that's that whole secondary market that I don't want to dive too deep into, but you may have a uh, pension plan or some type of investment that's tied into a group of mortgage-backed securities. As I said, you know, a lot of lenders might package up a bunch of loans, give it a rating, and then sell it off to another servicer. Well, some investments out there might be based on those because those are usually pretty well performing as long as they are good loans and people are paying them back that investment will make money so there's a whole secondary market for that and again not to get too into the weeds but it gives you a little bit better understanding hopefully of, of why that's important if it's saleable on the secondary market it could be a great investment mortgage-backed security is a, is a type of asset-backed security where mortgages are grouped together sold to government agencies or investment banks that then securitize or package them into a security that investors can buy. And as I said, it kind of helps keep the flow of money for lenders, offers a stable investment option for maybe your 401k plan. So the secondary market, just to give you a quick visual representation, starting with the lender or the bank there in the center, they sell the mortgage to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, releasing more funds so they can lend more. Now Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac sell that to uh, investors, they securitize it so that 
uh, groups of investors can then use that performance of those those loans to then make money. That interest is going to help those investors make money. Now, in the meantime, the lender also sends money out the other door to help more and more borrowers. So that's kind of the cycle of things. It's a way to help keep the flow of money coming in. Because if a lender ha is sitting on a billion dollars and they write a billion dollars worth of loans, they don't want to sit there and wait 30 years for all that money to come back in. So they package it up, sell it off, replenish their supply so they can keep the flow of lending going. Now, um, on conventional loans, a couple things to understand here. You could have private mortgage insurance. If you've ever heard the term PMI, now it's not homeowner's insurance. This is not the type of insurance that is going to protect you if a tree falls on your house. This is insurance that if you stop paying that mortgage, the lender has protection. So when you're putting as little as 3% down on a house, that's a higher risk category for a lender. Now, if you put 20% down, you don't have to pay PMI because if you're putting, you're, you're basically paying a fifth of the house off before you even buy it, chances are you're not going to walk away. Now, if you put 3% down and things get tough, well, it's a little bit easier to, to part ways and walk away from that house. So the lender doesn't want to be stuck paying for it. Therefore, they have this PMI policy. You pay it monthly. It's part of your mortgage payment. And then that just kind of balances the risk and allows lenders to take on a higher risk proposition. Now, PMI can work a couple ways. That there can be a lender paid PMI where it sounds great. Hey, let the lender pay it. But what it is is you basically don't have to pay the monthly PMI, but you take a higher interest rate. So it's kind of like the money's built into the rate. Could be good for the short term because it could end up giving you a lower payment. But over time, the longer you stay in that mortgage, if you were to pay the PMI, pay it off, and then once you have 20% equity, that PMI goes away, well, you'll never see that benefit if you take that higher rate. Again, all depends on your plan and what you intend to do with the home. So that's a great conversation to have with your loan officer. Okay, so FHA loans, most popular government loan, is created after the Great Depression, and it was to help boost home ownership, as I mentioned before. Now, they can be a little more lenient when it comes to credit issues. That's one of the big benefits of the FHA. So if you had a big credit event, the FHA will let you qualify sooner than a conventional loan. You can do as little as 3.5% down. There will be mortgage insurance. They have the monthly mortgage, but they also have an upfront fee that they tack on to your loan as well. But sometimes that's the best loan or the only loan that somebody might qualify. So it could be the difference of whether you get the home or not. Now the VA is a, a phenomenal loan for veterans. They don't have to put anything down and there's no PMI. So a huge benefit there. Then the USDA, again, it's for rural areas. You can actually do zero down with the USDA loan, but it does have mortgage insurance. All right. so. Hopefully, that helped give you some insight as to how the world of lending works and got you a little more familiar with some of the terms. Now, nothing's going to beat having a conversation with a, a quality loan officer such as myself, uh, which I would love to do if and when you're ready to buy a house. At the end of the day, this is about getting you some information, making sure that you can wrap your head around the process and, and hopefully not be as intimidated. Here's a few different ways to contact me, my email, my cell phone my website. So feel free to reach out if you have any further questions. Would love to help you get into a house. I know some great real estate agents too in the Northeast Ohio area that can definitely help you out if you need a referral. But um, let me know what I can do. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. Hopefully, like I said, it helps. And uh, if you need a good loan officer to help you when you're ready to purchase, Mitch Jenkins with Your Home Financial. Have a great day.